Hola, buenos dias. That's all I got for you. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for having me uh, here. I'm so excited to be in Santiago, and I really want to thank uh, Gabrielle and Lisa for organizing, and our technical team, thank you. And I've worked as a technical person for many years, and no one ever thanks the interpreters. Thank you to our amazing interpreters. Um, so let's go to first slide. We get video. Slide one. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I'm here all the way from Washington, D.C. to tell you about a problem. Washington, D.C. has a helicopter problem, and its residents seem somewhat unable to identify them or say what they're doing. Interestingly, when I started researching this talk, I found that Santiago has a similar problem. What if we could help residents identify helicopters? What if we could crowdsource helicopter tracking? What if we could make aircraft radio as accessible as reading a map? And what if we could do all of this on Twitter? Today, I want to tell you uh, a brief history of helicopters of the DC area, some unique features of uh, DC's airspace, and how that changed after September 11th. Uh, we'll talk about aircraft transponders, a powerful open data set that's in need of community contributors. And we'll talk about how transponders can be used in open source intelligence investigations. Then I'll tell you about our project and how we empower DC residents to submit photo reports of passing helicopters. We'll talk about our computer vision program and I'll even teach you how you can make your own computer vision program. Last, we'll give you some tips for building a sustainable data gathering community. And then we'll talk about aircraft radio, another powerful but underutilized open data set, and other ways that radio can be used in open source intelligence investigations. So to start, a U.S. president would first board a helicopter in 1959, but D.C.'s tumultuous helicopter history started in 1974, when a disgruntled military mechanic stole a helicopter and landed it on the White House lawn. In 1982, a Park Police helicopter would play an integral role in rescuing survivors from the freezing Potomac River after a plane crash. And then things were pretty quiet for about 19 years, until September 11th, 2001, when a plane crashed into the Pentagon, uh, the headquarters of the US military, just across the river from Washington, and smoke evacuated the nearby aircraft control tower. And in an unprecedented move, all air traffic control for the DC region was handed to the circling Park Police helicopter. So September 11th would also lead to changes that would make Washington, D.C. the most secure airspace in the United States. Like many uh, cities internationally, Washington is Class B airspace. This is called the upside down wedding cake by aviators. And this requires uh, communication with an air traffic control tower further away the higher you are. So in practice, this means an air uh, a jetliner at 30,000 feet is talking to a tower much further away than a helicopter circling at 500 feet. 
In addition to that, since 2003, in a response to 9-11, we have two additional uh, procedure unique to the area, Washington's Air Defense Identification Zone. But the most interesting part about this for non-aviators is that this is the only place in the world where authorities will point a low-level laser at your aircraft if you're violating the secure area. So as a result of these changes, much of DC's helicopter activity is reserved for the government and military. Like the DC um, National Guard, seen here performing a technique known as rotor wash. This is commonly used in war zones, but here it is being applied over peaceful protesters at the Black Lives Matter protests for uh, against police brutality in June 2020. Because of these constant military overflights, life in Washington, D.C. is frequently interrupted by the sound of low-level helicopters either transporting officials from one military base to another or simply training. I was frequently awakened by this sound and initially looked to aircraft tracking apps for answers. These aircraft tracking apps use transponders that are on the aircrafts. There have been many transponder protocols in the past, um, but the most prevalent now is ADSB. This stands for Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. Automatic because it does not require the pilot's intervention, dependent on a number of other sensors, like GPS and an altimeter, uh, surveillance in that it reports those sensors over broadcast on 978 or 1090 megahertz on encrypted. Now, these ADSB transponders are not universally required. Here's a look at where mandates or laws will stand as of 2023. Um, the countries in blue, like the United States, require ADSB in uh, certain airspaces. So you may have very good information about what's around you in a city, but in a rural area, you may have nothing. Countries in orange, like Canada, um, require it at a higher flight level. So you might have information about the jetliner overhead, but the helicopter at a low level may be absent. And Colombia is the sole country here in green that will require ADS-B at all flight levels and altitudes in 2023, or uh, airspaces and altitudes. And we could have some ideas as to why this might be. My colleague told me that it may be weather-related. Um, and narco traffic too, and, uh, but we don't know that for sure. Anyway. <laughs> but I'll cheer Colombia for their transparency. Um, a key part of getting this data to people is the feeders, people like you and me who collect aircraft information via an antenna at their home and then upload it via the internet to a feeder, uh, an aggregator like ADSB Exchange. Now, I highly recommend ADSB Exchange over any other flight tracker. The two reasons are they do not filter out the military and they do not filter out private operators. Uh, this is a big part of the business plan for the big flight trackers is letting rich people pay to remove their flights. Um, it's the reason Elon Jet uses ADSB Exchange. If you don't know, Elon Jet is the account that tracks Elon Musk's jet uh, around the world uh, when available, when data is available, and uh, reports his carbon usage as well. And it may be the reason that Elon started buying shares of Twitter. Uh, it's a pretty interesting rabbit hole to go down. But oh, sorry, I jumped the queue on that one. Um, but there are many other uses for ADSB data, and that's why I want to introduce you to Emmanuel Frudenthal, who is one of the founders of Dictator Alert. And do that like this. 
Um, my name is Emmanuel Fraudenthal and I run the Dictator Alert uh, website. I also am an investigative journalist. And uh, what Dictator Alert does is it tracks aircrafts used by uh, dictatorships all over the world and also use uh, this, the same data in investigations. So there's so many different stories that you can do with uh, ADSB data. We did an investigation into uh, Frontex, which is a European border agency, and we showed that they were aware of illegal pushbacks, pushing migrants, asylum seekers, back to another country which is illegal, which is what the Greek Coast Guards were doing, and Frontex was saying they were not aware, and we basically proved that some of the planes but that are, you know, full of cameras were, were circling around uh, when some of these pushbacks were happening. The main downside of ADSB exchange is in Africa, for example, there's very little coverage. Uh, so I've installed some antennas, but mostly it's, it's uh, uncovered. Whereas if you go on the commercial websites, there's more coverage, but of course, as you know, not all the planes show up. But if you're, you know, in South America or in, uh, in Africa, it's going to make a big difference in terms of the coverage, and that means that the main source of unfiltered aircraft data, ADSB data, uh, is going to be much better. The, the Twitter bot that tracks uh, dictators coming and going from Geneva is the oldest one. It's been there since 2016, I think. Basically, there's a guy who's protesting against the noise at the airport, and so he was tracking the noise that um, aircraft were making and because you know um, he wanted to know which aircraft was making the noise he started collecting this data you can actually see on the website dictatoralert.org you can see per dictatorship all of the flights all over the world so adsb exchange desperately needs more feeders in south america tech savvy people like you who can set up an antenna at your home and feed data to the international community. If you live in a place without a circle on this map, seems pretty likely, uh, and you are interested in doing this, come talk to me after. I have some tools I want to give you. Um, please, I, I want to get you started. I want to change this map by the next time I come to Santiago. But with that, I want to tell you about Helicopters DC, the Twitter account I started in 2020 to attempt to answer some of these questions initially using ADSB data. Um, however, we found, while we had some flights, uh, the data was woefully incomplete, despite there being plenty of feeders in the DC area. This is because government flights in the US are exempt from our ADSB mandate. Uh, and while they're supposed to only exercise that exemption in certain um, times, they uh, frequently uh, use it for things like flyovers at Arlington Cemetery um, or uh, recruiting events, um, so we don't have that data. Uh, so we looked at other public data sets that could help us answer the helicopter questions, like the President's Daily Schedule, uh, which is published every morning at 8 a.m., and uh, FactBase here lets us download a CSV which we parse for relevant terms, convert those into cron jobs, and send tweets later in the day. So that's how we get automatic presidential departures and arrivals. This technique is also useful for uh, military flyovers at the local stadiums. And this is a pretty big deal in the US and Washington DC in particular. Um, in 2015, the US military paid $6 million to the National Football League, American football, for the right to do these types of flyovers and other promotional events. So even looking at those two public data sets, we weren't getting most of the helicopters. We did, however, have a couple thousand Twitter followers. So I thought, what if I could get my Twitter followers to send me the helicopters. And in October 2020, we started Copter Spotter, which is a platform that lets DC residents self-report helicopters with a photo, a video, the type of helicopter if they know it, and the heading, and some data from Twitter, the time, date, and geolocation. 
We take that and we create a map with a retweet of the original tweet and we tie that type to a probable operator of who operates that type of helicopter in the DC area. What this creates is a running feed of helicopter activity over the district and to get people to actually do this, we made it a game. It turns out humans are pretty competitive. Now, something to understand about Twitter is that, conceptually at least, every tweet you send can reach the feed of every one of your followers. So this type of automatic data when using like ADSB can quickly overflow and, and create too much um, action on followers' feeds, and we lost a lot of followers that way. But since we've moved to the self-reporting model, we've gotten not only better data in that we have the government helicopters, but it tends to highlight helicopters that are problematic, like flying low, back and forth, or circling. Uh, another reason Twitter is the perfect platform for us is it's where news breaks. It's also where people come for information about what's happening in their neighborhood, and crucially, to complain. They've also been very friendly towards bots in the past, and we really hope that's going to be true under new ownership. Here's a look at how Twitter data works if you want to make your own bot. Every tweet has a 19-digit tweet ID. That will uh, end when we get to 10 quintillion tweets. And uh, most of my bots look at my mentions feeds and wait for this number to increment, the latest tweet ID. And then they run scripts based on what happened. Um, the location data on Twitter used to be you could tag a specific latitude and longitude. But they discontinued that in 2019 in favor of Foursquare locations, which instead give you a bounding box. By default, this is your city, which is way too big for our use case. So we ask users to tag a specific building or park, and then we subdivide that and plot the center point. <laughs> now, if this data seems like it might be a little squishy to you, uh, that could be a feature, because I'll admit, tracking government and military helicopters very precisely could be a vulnerability. And I, I do care about the safety of our servicemen and women. However, um, this data is obscured not only by this technique, but also by the time it takes someone to take a photo write a description, and post it. So this data is uh, delayed enough that it's still useful to residents, but wouldn't be useful to an adversary who'd have much better data with a pair of binoculars. Quickly, I want to talk about our tools. Uh, we started this all on a Raspberry Pi, which was great, until the power went out. Um, so we found Google Cloud to be well worth a couple dollars a month. And we also use Google Maps static API a lot. This is really cool. Um, you pass it a string of coordinates. You can optionally give it um, routes, zones, waypoints, custom icons, and the dimensions of the photo you want. And it spits out a PNG. Couple Python libraries, Tweepy for Twitter. Uh, and G spread for interfacing with Google Sheets. Now, I know I should be using a database solution for this, but when you're relying on volunteers to review uh, data, the versatility of Google Sheets is pretty powerful. Uh, FFmpeg is a tool for everything related to audio and video. And you'll see that later in the um, presentation. And Selenium is a multi-platform tool for um, automating Chrome. So I think it's designed to uh, prototype and uh, debug websites. But we use it for screenshots and 
I don't want to say scraping because we don't use it that heavily, but yes, extracting information from websites. Now, a couple tips of what's worked for us to build this community. Uh, the first thing is that I think this project would have been perceived very differently if I wasn't a DC resident, uh, subject to the same noises as everyone else, um, and submitting data from my own account frequently. Um, by that same token, uh, being genuine, putting my face on the account early on in the form of videos that explained what we were doing, gave people a lot of confidence that they're not giving their data to a conglomerate, an advertiser, a foreign power. So this may not work for you, depending on your project, you may choose to be anonymous. But if you can be a person, a real person, it can bring people to your cause. Additionally, give attribution. So we looked at how uh, we retweet sightings. Not only are people compelled to submit to us to get that retweet from an account with 15,000 followers, but giving this attribution allows for proper chain of custody so that open source intelligence techniques can take place should there be an incident that requires them. Be inclusive of not only groups, but ideas. Uh, the demographics of this project were not what I thought they would be when I started, but we also serve people who are fascinated by jets and helicopters and their technology, and people who are just annoyed by the noise they make. So I try to balance that in my coverage and editorial. And the last point is give the data back. So whether this is making your data set open or making your Google Sheet uh, a web accessible, which is very easy, or making a full-fledged data browser like the Copter Spotter map by my colleague Sam Reese. This lets anyone filter our data set by time, date, geolocation, and uh, operator, so you can find out what was flying over you. And uh, this is powered by Mapbox. We also have a form so users can submit independent of Twitter, which may become very important soon. Uh, one of our users does tell us this makes it easier for her to submit helicopters from her work computer <laughs> when she, so she's not on Twitter. Um, unintended but welcome use case. So we collected over 10,000 of these copter spots. Users submitted reports in 2021. And this is the data we collected uh, broken down by operator. You can see in the bracket the small amount that would normally be available on ADSB data. Everything else is novel data, and the FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, our regulatory agency for aircraft, says they don't track military aircraft. So despite our limitations and fuzziness, we probably have the most comprehensive data set of its kind. And this is not just for fun. Where helicopters are flying and where helicopters are not flying can make big news stories, like January 6, 2021, when there was an insurrection at our US Capitol and the only helicopter circling was DC's local police. Where were those military helicopters that are sworn to protect us? Where is the specific Air Force squadron in charge of VIP evacuation? Seems like it would have been useful. The FAA could not tell you, but our data set can. Of course, once you collect thousands of photos of aircraft from the user's perspective, the next step is kind of obvious. You create a computer vision program to identify them automatically. And so now, our bot responds to any photo sent to it with the type, the uh, confidence that it has in that inference, and probable operators of that type, again, over the district. I can't overstate how transformative instant answers have been to our users. And even 
critiquing when the bot gets it wrong or cheering it on when it gets a difficult spot right has driven a new level of engagement to the project. It's been really great. This is made possible with RoboFlow because I really didn't want to have to roll out my own computer vision infrastructure. RoboFlow is a startup that helps small and medium teams manage their computer vision data and collaborate. And I'll show you how important this is because we're gonna make a new data set right here from scratch. I created a new RoboFlow account for free and our data set is gonna be called Things That Fly. We're going to do um, bounding box uh, so it's not detecting the whole image in its entirety, but objects within the photos. And we'll start by just dragging some images to our data set. We'll start with uh, some planes, uh, helicopters, and birds. Um, the last thing you'll see here is a video of birds in flight, and RoboFlow will ask you how many frames do you want to extract from this video? This is a very tedious process without RoboFlow. Very, very useful. So once we have a few images here, uh, it doesn't require a ton, we'll start our annotations. This is where you wanna bring a friend because you are drawing boxes around each of these objects and classifying them. It's so fun, right? So it is possible to do polygons um, and one of the reasons you might wanna do that is because the extra space around the object uh, can actually be teaching the computer vision program to detect the sky and the clouds that are behind the object. Um, so it, it'll work for, for this model. Um, and the last thing you'll see when we're done here with our annotations is RoboFlow asks us how we wanna divide into train, valid, and test buckets. This has to do with how computer vision models are trained. Um, and we'll go to the Generate tab. This allows us to multiply the number of photos in our data set by adding augmentations. So a couple logical ones will be exposure. This will compensate for lighting and differences in camera. And rotation, because objects in flight are not always perfectly horizontal. We would also uh, flip them across the horizontal axis uh, for symmetry. We'll multiply our objects here by three, so we just took, I think, 20 images and, and made a data set of 60. Uh, quickly, so this is where you could take it to a different platform if you wanted to, but we are going to train our data set on RoboFlow's infrastructure, which is, saves you money, uh, and we will start with their public models as a starting point, which just helps us with object detection. Now, this training can take up to 24 hours, but in our case, it took 10 minutes. <laughs> so, we can uh, start our inferences by just dragging images into the browser window, and we'll see this performs pretty well for 20 images and 10 minutes of work. Uh, if you have thousands of images, you'll do even better. And you can roll this out from RoboFlow's infrastructure via API in a variety of coding languages. You can use it on a Raspberry Pi with a camera, you can use your computer webcam, or you can build a public-facing web interface. RoboFlow also has a universe of open source models that might help you get started, or they might just already have the perfect thing for you. As uh, when you have a free account, um, you will be included in these public data sets. So I wanna cover a couple advanced computer vision techniques. Um, one has to do with the fact that we are currently using one model with 19 helicopter types and colors. Liveries is the technical term. And, um, what we'll probably look to do in the future is fine grain classification. This is where you use several models. The first might say, is it a helicopter, like our data set that we just created? And then once you answer that question, and root out some false positives, you can say, well, what type of helicopter is it? You could even look at just black and white silhouettes of helicopters at this stage. 
And then lastly, you could say, well, what livery or color is it of that type before returning the probable operator? So we'll probably look to doing this in the future. Um, another technique that we're not as hot to pursue is synthetic data. When you are detecting things that are man-made, it is possible to build your data set using 3D models and rotating them along their axes, uh, scripting with Python, and screenshotting them with various backgrounds to build a data set of millions of images overnight. Now, this is really powerful, but I really like the idea that our data set is based on users' um, submissions, so I'm, I'm not looking to pursue this too soon. One thing I, I am looking to pursue with computer vision is answering the question of what is the news gathering helicopter doing circling my house? Well, we're looking up at them, they're looking down at us, and those images end up on the local news broadcast, local news sites, and local journalists' Twitter. So if we scrape those sources and run them through a computer vision model, we can tell people automatically what uh, the news helicopter is doing, whether it's a medical evacuation, golf courses, uh, <laughs> um, uh, rescue crews, fire, water events, uh, like flooding, weather, um, can all be detected automatically. And so this is kind of my next year goal, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's, it's not gonna be too hard. So the last part of what we call the Copter Spotter Toolkit was built out of the need to have better information once the sun goes down and visual identification is no longer useful. Uh, so we found a volunteer near DC's airport willing to host a Raspberry Pi in a waterproof case um, to collect radio signals from DCA, uh, our local airport. This relies on an RTL SDR for scale. Uh, <laughs> this is a software-defined radio, and these were commonly used as TV tuners for computers until hackers realized they could tune just about anything from the transponder signals we looked at earlier, to police scanners, to downlinking weather satellite imagery you can do with this. So we're looking at simple AM radio, and we're collecting it and breaking it into individual calls, which we then upload to a sub-account called UFOs of DC. From here, people can listen to the radio call and they can transcribe it for us. Power 4, 3, 0, 2, 3, requesting uh, 2 to 1, 1 to the south, and route 4, back to Davis. That one for approved. So from here, our main account builds a map of the described features, the routes, zones, waypoints, and much better information about the operator. Uh, a Blackhawk helicopter, for example, in the D.C. area could be National Guard, Army, or FBI, or Homeland Security, but when you're listening to the radio, their call sign indicates the exact operator, which makes it very powerful. Sometimes, though, uh, certain radio calls require a different approach, like this one. And uh, Blackjack 2, we just had a near miss. I request you mark the tape, please. This is a Coast Guard helicopter reporting a near miss, a near collision with another helicopter. These incidents are well documented by aviators, but you would never hear about this on your local news. Add an image and a subtitle and you can get 4,000 Twitter users to be more aware of the dangers of what's flying above their head. We hope we do this enough, we may even reach our lawmakers. So another way that radio can be used to better the public's understanding is at the municipal level. This is fire, ambulances, police scanners, uh, metro rail, bus lines, and why I want to introduce you to another friend of mine, Luke Burnt, who created Open Megahertz. 
you know, as a DHS, I was working on interoperability standards for first responders. So I got really in depth with the standards for the radio systems. I got myself an SDR and I was like, well, hey, you know, I, I lived a block away from a fire station. So I was like, I want to find out why the fire engine's going by. You have like one channel that's sort of the, it's called the control channel. So it's sort of like a, a traffic operator or someone in the middle sort of coordinating all of these um, different frequencies. And when someone wants to talk, they, they get to get the next available one. In 2015, built out open megahertz to add away uh, so other people could start uh, uploading their recordings. In addition to all the audio, you also just get lots of interesting information on you know what talk groups are active, who's talking when. People could build and put it into databases or do whatever kind of like data management they want with it or build different audio pipelines. So sort of opening it up a bit and making it a little more extendable, I think would sort of be the goal. So Open Megahertz relies on using two SDRs, one to listen to the control signal and one to hop to each frequency to collect the calls, and then it uploads that audio to a server so the whole world can listen to the municipal radio of your area. Obviously, this makes open source intelligence gathering uh, much easier, and it, one of the journalists uh, we work with has used this system to document police dispatches to the wrong addresses. This, unfortunately, has resulted in a loss of life, but having this kind of accountability to your local agencies can be really powerful, but they are trying to stop us. Uh, radio encryption of police and sometimes even fire and ambulance frequencies is in growing increasingly uh, more prevalent. Um, in the US, one of the reasons they cite for this is for the security of tactical communications, but very widespread use has drawn criticism for hindering government accountability, transparency, and making it difficult for journalists to do their jobs. Um, one of the concerns in this encryption is, are the agencies storing their radio calls and can they be unsealed by a judge in a court? This reinforces to me the reason that radio is transient, and once it passes by us, it may be gone. So we should capture it whenever possible, legally. Let's look at a couple other techniques. One has to do with encryption. So this is a normal like AM signal, and then you, you would turn it into data, um, encrypted, and uh, Note, decrypting these radio signals in the US is very illegal. Um, but we have three military branches, and by simply looking at the metadata of when a signal is on or off, we could discern which agency is active without decrypting the signals. You know, the government's using metadata, we should use metadata too. Uh, another technique is known as passive radar. So this relies on the ambient signals around us, uh, like from our phone or FM towers, collected by two SDR. One pointed the direction uh, with the directional antenna of an uh, aircraft or a car, and another looking at a clean reference signal. When compared, you can get a radar-like readout. Here, seen compared to ADS-B data, and this could be a very powerful way to monitor cars, traffic on your street, aircraft that are not using transponders, um, and probably other applications I'm not even thinking of. Another technique is MLAT. Now, this relies on uh, calculating aircraft location by the time of arrival of these signals at various different receivers. So ADS-B exchange already uses multiple feeders to calculate uh, the location of like military aircraft that have old transponders that don't give you latitude and longitude, for example. So I wanna answer some of my frequently asked questions here. Uh, the first is, why don't you automate this? Whether it's 
cameras that automatically photograph helicopters, or automatically transcribing radio calls, or listening to the sound the helicopter makes and making a, a machine learning model to detect them by sound, that one's actually pretty cool. The problem I have is that um, it's very hard to take automated data like that and make it automatically into a news story that is useful to residents. The second problem may be legal. What we're doing currently relies on freedom of speech laws that say, there's a helicopter, I have the right to photograph it. I have the right to send it to my friend, Helicopters of DC, he has the right to map it. But if I'm automatically collecting all of this data and logging it and doing analytics, that's a little bit of a different situation. And that also leads to my next question, which is, can you do this in my city? Uh, I've fielded this question from New York, which has a lot of um, sightseeing helicopters and shuttles to and from the airport, uh, which are on ADSB, so we could do it that way. Uh, and also, I fielded this question from London. Apparently, the royals quite like traveling by helicopter as well. This has a similar legal problem, which is that I think it's a bad look for one guy in Washington, D.C. to be surveilling worldwide governments, uh, especially when my face is on the project. So I'm a little wary of that, uh, and although there are places where it would be very useful. I'll give you an example. In Tokyo, they have frequent U.S. military helicopters flying over them at low level. This is so such a problem, they even had a U.S. military helicopter crash into the University of Okinawa in 2014. So, I'm sorry, the U.S. is exporting our helicopter noise. This is the guideline I've come up with. Provide only useful data and share the burden of disclosing government flights with residents who are making the reports. In conclusion, I want to go back to the questions I asked at the beginning of this talk. Can we help residents identify what's around them? Can we crowdsource difficult data sets? Can we use the radio to bring information to the public? in an accessible manner. Can we, as hackers, use what we know about computers to better the public's understanding? This is part of an emerging field called public interest technology. And it's a call to action for people like us to consider not working for a big conglomerate, but instead working for an organization with a public interest focus, work for the news, create a project like this that serves the public interest, or work for the government. I understand Chile recently redrafted its constitution and probably will again. Think of how important it will be for people, for a person who understands technology to be in the room person who understands mass surveillance, internet privacy, internet access to rural areas, and e-learning. I mean, maybe one day Ignacio could do this job. But today, it's up to you. So I want to encourage all of you to consider using your hacker skills for good. Combat disinformation. Contribute to open data sets. Create those open data sets. Speak truth to power. And better the public's understanding. Gracias. Y, uh, gracias. Y preguntas. ¿Sí?
Aló. ¿Preguntas? Eh, hola. Oh, oh. Buenos días. Eh, Permiso. Sí. ¿Ahí sí. Gracias. Eh, buenos días. Eh, quería preguntarte acerca de generar tanta información, eh, informar a la gente, hacerla más culta, darle más herramientas para que aprendan. Lo encuentro interesante, lo encuentro útil, lo encuentro bien, pero en cuanto a entregar la información eh, gubernamental, militar, de policía, considero que es una espada de doble filo en muchos casos, porque como viste en el, lo que pasó en el septiembre, en tu caso en Estados Unidos, eh, fue una catástrofe, fue algo horrible, y hay mucha gente igual en este mundo que está esperando la oportunidad de generar caos, generar disturbios, generar males. En el caso de saber cómo se mueve un general en un helicóptero y una persona quiere apuntar a ese general, no va a tener que estudiarlo, se va a ahorrar mucho tiempo y va a saber los movimientos del helicóptero, en qué momento está, dónde está pasando. ¿No crees que en ese caso sería un riesgo en especial más que una ayuda para las personas? Porque solamente decir, hay un helicóptero que está volando sobre mí, ¿qué está haciendo? Me molesta el sonido. Yo no puedo hacer nada para eh, silenciar un helicóptero y lo único que podría saber es decirle qué es lo que está pasando, pero esa persona necesita saber, es necesario de que sepa qué es lo que está pasando. Thank you for the question. Um, okay, so I'll note a couple things. Uh, the first is that Washington DC, we have a lot of problems. One of them is rooted in the fact that we are not a US state. We are a district and our laws that we pass for our, our, what would be a state is subject to congressional review. It gives us very little power. Um, for instance, when that event was happening at the US Capitol, um, we couldn't deploy our own DC National Guard fast enough. The US Congress had to take action to do that, whereas any other state could do that. This is just to illustrate an example because Washington DC is frequently stepped on, you know? <laughs> and so we are not a military installation and when we have constant military helicopters flying very low, they don't need to fly this low, um, I believe taking some action to make that less desirable to them. Secrecy uh, can be powerful, but to further your question, there are things that they could do to mitigate this. If they were to turn on ADSB, for example, when they're not transporting a general, then we could take an action to say, well, we know that you're doing one thing and not doing another thing, and we're not going to surveil you. We could do that, but they don't want to give us any information. And I think that desire to give no one any information is very dangerous, uh, is very, hurts residents. Another example is those flyovers of the cemetery that they do for, uh, you know, generals who have died. They don't announce those often. What, why, what incentive would they have to not publicly announce why they're doing an honorary flyover? Um, so I think there are a lot of examples where um, we could work better together if we were given a little bit of information. Um, and Uh, the other example I'll give you about mitigating dangers, because we talked about the radio, and that gives us routes. Um, when the president is moving, for example, instead of saying we're taking this route, this route, this zone, they pre-file their flight plan with DC's airport, and they, on the radio, say, Marine One proceeding as briefed, and they go. And they could do that, any military branch could do that, but they would be allowing 
the DC airport to have a record of where they've been and uh, have residents be able to know which military branch is most active. So there's reasons they, they don't want to do these things and they're not all in the interest of security. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Si. Gracias. Uh, thank you, uh, Andrew, for, for this talk. I think that um, it's a wonderful contribution for the community. Uh, it's very interesting. And I would like to be part of the, of the project also. And that uh, is leading my question here. Um, have you have deal regarding the legal implications of doing this? In especially, obviously, for you in the States. But for example, in my case, if I would like to be part of the project, I am from Colombia. And um, I am wondering regarding the um, legal implications uh, of this and also the risk of being treated, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I would like to, to, to get your insights regarding these, these things. Yes, I can't tell you about your local laws. <laughs> I'm not your lawyer. <laughs> Um, what we're doing, I believe, is all protected under our free speech laws. Um, and my DEF CON presentation had more information about that geared towards a U.S. audience. But um, what I will say is that everything we are using is public information, including ADSB data in Colombia. You should have a lot of it. Um, so definitely consult your, your local law book, and, uh, but I do not really anticipate you would have any problem being a feeder of ADSB data if you wanted to contribute to the project that way. I would love to help you out. I have some tools for you. Um, and so yeah, consult your local lawyers. <laughs> um, hi. Uh, first, I'd like to say that uh, I think this project is really good when it comes to transparency. I, I really like that. Uh, but my question goes about uh, other stakeholders, because you've mentioned the reactions you've gotten from residents, that they are um, taking photos, they're participating, they're engaged, they're, you, you created a sort of a game dynamic for them, and there's also uh, news, like the news, the journalists are responding uh, well to this. Uh, has there been any pushback, any reactions, or any change? I'm, I'm thinking not, but uh, from the officials, the military, the police, and also, uh, is there any instance of bad guys using this data, like, like, oh, there's a cop, helicopter coming, let's not do this, or let's... Okay, yes, there's a lot of things I want to talk about in that. Um, not only are DC residents very concerned, we are giving that information to our lawmakers and demanding change. And that's a pretty US-centric thing, so I didn't cover in this pre presentation, but there is even a Quiet Skies Caucus of lawmakers who have come together to talk specifically about aircraft noise. So this is on lawmakers' radar. Um, one of our local congressmen did cheer my efforts, which was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I will say I've had uh, only one negative comment, I think, um, that was from someone uh, not from Washington, D.C., who said, I'm an anarchist and the FBI needs to be watching me. Um, which, you know, I think uh, he would say that about a lot of hacker projects. Um, so, I'm sorry, repeat the last part of your question if you, um. Like, are there any recorded instances or any anecdotes of right. bad guys right. using this? Right, data? thank you. Um, so, no, with aircraft data. Um, there has been an instance where one of these helicopters was shot at by a, a person with a handgun probably an insane person. Um, no evidence that they needed any kind of data to see a helicopter and shoot at a helicopter. And, and that is horrible. And if there was any reason for me to believe that this was 
a danger, I would stop doing it. And for example, I um, am going to make exclusion zones for our local military bases, because if they want to practice over their military bases, um, that's their business, not ours, and that's fine. Um, but I will give you another example, which is uh, from an article about radioreference.com, a great website that gives you the local frequencies so you can tune into all the different things in your neighborhood. Um, they said, in the interest of encrypting police radio, that uh, one police department once reported that they thought they heard someone being chased listening to their radio audibly while they were being chased. So, and that is to the ends of adding encryption. Uh, however, um, what radio reference or uh, liveatc.net is another one that gives you on-demand um, information about air, aircraft. Uh, it is delayed by 30 seconds. And uh, groups have responded to that, uh, radio enthusiast groups, have responded to that article by saying, in a foot chase, 30 seconds of delay, if he was listening on his smartphone, would make it not useful to know what the police are saying 30 seconds later. So, you know, the delay is, is a crucial part of, um, of protecting our, our helicopters as well, but that is a risk. If there was an incident, we would really have to rethink um, our perspective, and I really hope that's not the case. But like we said about the two helicopters that almost collided, Residents not knowing that that is possible is also bad. Thank you. Hola, buenas. En el caso de recolección de datos de manera particular, ¿a quién tenemos que administrar esos datos obtenidos, además de si hay alguna posibilidad de desincriptación y clasificación de nivel crítico de los mensajes que se envían? Uh, yeah, so encrypted radio would be the, the legal manner by which they would, um, it wouldn't be technically classified, but it does make it illegal for us to attempt to decrypt it. Uh, I think they would have a very hard time arguing that anything that is readily observable in plain sight, or as the Federal Communications uh, has said about radio calls, anything on AM radio is, is fair game. Uh, I think they would have a very hard time saying that any of that is classified. Uh, and uh, we, yeah, I don't, I don't really have any um, concerns about classified information. If that answers your question. Además, la antena CDR, ¿hasta cuál es su capacidad? Oh, the power. Okay, so you're receiving. So it's, uh, these SDRs don't even transmit. Um, I know Pedro yesterday was t talking about the hack RF1. That is capable of transmitting, which you have to be very careful about, because that's a good way to go to jail. Um, also, we talked about laser pointers. Never point a laser pointer at an aircraft, ever, uh, please. Um, so uh, the SDRs uh, receive is not a, a function of power, but it has to do with your antenna placement and the length of your cord from your antenna to the SDR um, lowers your signal um, and the type of antenna that you have. So uh, if you're doing something specialized like ADSB, I have some ADSB antennas here, extra ones if you already have an SDR, I'd be happy to give you. Um, and that will help you get better performance um, when tracking aircraft, specialized cases. 
Eh, muchas gracias. Hi, hello. From your left. Um, I, I was wondering if uh, any of these uh, these um, techniques or, or um, crowdsourcing, uh, uh, gathering data, uh, is used in in the United States uh, for tracking not only the police or not only this uh, military, but uh, also to to bad guys um, as crowdsourcing, uh, because uh, it's. Uh, yeah, we can. We we need to monitor uh, what is uh, uh, it's the state doing in case of uh, uh, cases like it's January six. But uh, but also in in the other way, uh, is there any other group uh, working on that in the states? Probably depends on your definition of bad guy, uh, because I think uh, during protests and moments of um, mass unrest, monitoring police could be useful not, not even to evade arrest for something you did, but to avoid arrest for something you didn't do. Uh, so there's things to weigh there. I don't know of any examples of criminals using crowdsourcing but it's a very interesting idea. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't condone that. Um, but there are other people using crowdsourcing, of course. Um, one that I really like is called iNaturalist. Um, this is an app that lets you submit questions about um, plants and animals that you find in your environment and it's logged and they have competitions every year to try to generate this data. So there's, um, and people can answer questions and tell you what kind of animal or plant that you're looking at and is it poisonous? <laughs> can I eat it? Um, so there's a lot of useful uh, ways to use crowdsourcing and that's just, I wanna give you these ideas. Hi, here, Felipe. Um, well, I, I live really close to the, the one of the airport in, in Santiago. So how community, how we can, can combat the, the, the annoying <laughs> of the airplane or the helicopter with, with your tools? How can you what with the airplane? Uh, combat with the, the with not combat, but how oh, we, we, oh. We, can, we can disemployment to the government for the annoying sound. Accountability. Uh, yes, uh, okay. I, I wake up every Sunday with uh, 6 a.m. with the helicopter in my, in my, my window, so. Um, I don't know if there's, a, uh, combat is not a good word. <laughs> not, yes. um, accountability. Um, yes, so if you live near the airport, I wanna talk to you about becoming an ADSB feeder, for sure. That's a good way to take the information that is in the airwaves near your house and let the internet see that, so that other people who hear that helicopter can see that it was near your house earlier, and that maybe, maybe it's a medical helicopter. I uh, have been observing the helicopters around Santiago while I'm here, and I'll give you a couple things. Uh, the ADSB coverage is obviously bad, um, but you can already discern a police helicopter because they're circling and they have visible camera domes uh, on the bottom. And then by contrast to that, um, medical helicopters tend to just go from one point to another. There's no reason for them to circle. So there are already some common sense things you can start to think about to identify a helicopter. Um, although the specific operator, if you're trying to write them a letter and complain about the noise, it would be useful to have the ADSB data. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Great talk, gracias, great keynote. Gracias. This is for you. Gracias.